Welcome to Question of the Week. This is the Facebook Live session where I take on your science faith questions. Mondays, 9.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 12.30 in the afternoon for those of you on the East Coast. This week's question comes from my Facebook friend, Brian Brock, who sent me a few weeks ago a private message with a link to a BBC article written by uh, science writer Colin Barras. And in this article, uh, which was published May 18, 2017, uh, the writer uh, discusses the issue of the quest for the last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees. The title of the article is The Missing Link, and the abstract is this. There was once an animal that was an ancestor to both humans and apes, but what was it like? And this article prompts a larger question, namely, have anthropologists discovered the last common ancestor that would have given rise to both humans and chimpanzees as evolutionary sister species? So we're going to take on that question in just a minute, but I want to ask those of you who are watching this broadcast to please, uh, in the comment section, identify yourself, say hi, let us know where you're watching from. This is incredibly valuable information for us. In fact, uh, the last time we did a broadcast, which was last week, there were a number of people internationally watching the broadcast. Janet Lopez from Australia watched the broadcast, uh, as did Dennis Dahl from Vancouver, British Columbia, and then finally Lucas uh, Tonesi, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, or Tunesi, uh, from Brazil, I, I'm sorry Lucas if I mispronounced your name, also uh, checked in and watched the broadcast. So again, please let us know who you are, where you're watching from, that information is really very much appreciated. Also, uh, go ahead and react to the broadcast if you're watching on Facebook using the like button. The more likes that we get, the more comments that we get, the greater the visibility this broadcast gets in Facebook streams. So you're going a long way towards helping us out by, uh, by uh, checking in or by liking the broadcast. And then last but not least, if you want to offer your perspective on this question, have anthropologists discovered the last common ancestor of humans and chimps, I would be, love to hear, hear your perspective, even if your perspective disagrees with my viewpoint. I want to foster an environment, as I've said before, on my public figure and my personal Facebook page where people can talk about these very important issues. Now, as we get started with this broadcast, when I posted the announcement of this week's broadcast and the topic that we were going to be dis uh, discussing, a couple of my Facebook friends offered some comments. And so I'd like to respond to those comments as we get into a discussion of this article and this broader question at large. Uh, Matt McClure, who is uh, a good Facebook friend, he's a really good man, evolutionary creationist, a trained evolutionary biologist, a college professor, uh, writes this comment, the BBC article misdefines missing link to refer to only the last common ancestor, whereas throughout the tenure of its usage, missing link has referred to any fossil anatomical intermediate form. That's a really good point that Matt McClure makes that I actually agree with. The, the title of the article is mislabeled. It's not a great title. I suspect that either the author of this piece or uh, editors at the BBC titled it The Missing Link because of its use in common parlance, because this is how people think of uh, hominins in the fossil record as missing links. But I would very much agree with Matt as he goes on to comment the difference between a missing link and the last common ancestor is profound. The last common ancestor would be that ancestral species that gave rise, in this case, to two separate lineages, one culminating in modern humans, one culminating in chimps and bonobos, 
whereas the missing link would refer to these transitional intermediates in the fossil record creatures like Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and, and Lucy, and so on and so forth. So Matt makes a very good point that I don't uh, disagree with whatsoever, uh, but I would point out that it was probably a tactic employed uh, by these uh, editors or the science writer just simply to get a broader exposure and broader interest in the article. This is actually an incredibly well-written piece that I would highly recommend to everybody, regardless of your religious or philosophical perspective on and regardless of your views or your stance on human evolution. It's a very well-written piece that gives a wonderful retrospective of the history of this idea of the last common ancestor in the construct of the evolutionary paradigm and uh, uh, does a beautiful job of giving us insight as to the latest thinking when it comes to, uh, again, the identity, the character, the nature of this last common ancestor that from an evolutionary perspective produced both humans and chimpanzees. So I highly commend the article to you. It's a very well-written piece, one of the best pieces of science writing I've read in a long period of time. Now, as I, again, broach this topic, another Facebook friend named Old Glass Stuff said this, if you don't buy the idea of common descent, then looking seriously for the last common ancestor of humans and apes is something you would not spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, that's an interesting point, and the rationale for taking on this question, even though I am an old earth creationist who is highly skeptical of the evolutionary paradigm, is first and foremost, uh, if you're looking at uh, an understanding of human evolution, it's important to uh, recognize the work that's going on currently in this discipline. What are the latest ideas? This is just part of having a high level of scientific literacy. So being interested in this question and trying to understand what um, evolutionary biologists are doing as they try to make sense of, again, this the identity of the last common ancestor for humans and chimps is very important, regardless, again, of one's philosophical perspective. But again, as somebody who is an old earth creationist who is skeptical of the evolutionary paradigm, I see the evolutionary paradigm is a competitor to my views. And so I definitely want to understand the latest ideas in order to be able to offer the best possible critique of the best thinking that evolutionary biologists are bringing to the table. And so that's why we're interested uh, old glass stuff uh, in, in terms of addressing this topic. Now, let me go ahead and just give a summary of the article and along with that kind of the the uh, the history and the the status currently for the identity of the last common ancestors of humans and chimps and then I'm going to offer very briefly just some pers some comments and share my perspective on the importance of this question and um, the importance of this particular article um, when you talk about the uh, origin of humanity from an evolutionary standpoint, this idea really traces its genesis in large measure to Charles Darwin. In 1856, Darwin published uh, On the Origin of Species, and as the author of this piece rightly notes, uh, when Darwin wrote Origins of Species, he was very careful to make sure that he did not uh, discuss the question of human origins. He was simply trying to get a hearing for his theory of evolution in a broad sense and realize that the question of human evolution was really a loaded topic with all kinds of theological baggage. And so he very carefully, for political reasons, avoided that idea. In 1863, Thomas Huxley, who was an ally of uh, Charles Darwin, wrote a book called Evidences uh, as to Man's Place in Nature, where he proposes this idea of human evolution, the idea that Darwin's theory of evolution would apply to humanity as well. And along with that, he introduces the notion of a sister species, that there should be species alive today that we would have shared an evolutionary ancestry with. And he identifies chimpanzees and gorillas as our species 
again, sister species from an evolutionary standpoint. Uh, also, as part and parcel of this idea of human evolution was a notion that there was this ancestral species that produced not only modern humans, but again, our sister species in, in an evolutionary sense. In 1874, I believe, uh, Darwin wrote his book, or published his book, I should say more appropriately, uh, The Descent of Man, where he applies his theory of, hu of evolution to the origin of humanity. And again, uh, provides thinking along the lines of Thomas Huxley. Interestingly enough, at that particular juncture in time, and actually throughout most of the history of evolutionary anthropology, the, the, the great apes, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, have largely served as a proxy, as an evolutionary stand-in for the last common ancestor, where people argue that this last common ancestor would have been a knuckle-walking creature that would have had a wrist structure and a hand structure very similar to gorillas and to chimpanzees. That they would these, these creatures would have had a shoulder structure also similar to the great apes because they viewed this creature as not only knuckle-walking, but also as a brachiating species, meaning that it moved through uh, through the trees in a swinging motion. They would have envisioned this last common ancestor to live in a woodland environment that was forced into a open savanna that drove the emergence of bipedalism for evolutionary adv advantages that th this creature would have been driven through this evolutionary pressure to stand erect and to begin to move around on two feet. And then finally, um, they would argue that the pelvis, the the structure of the femurs, the, the length of the, the forelimbs, uh, the structure of the rib cage would have all have been similar to the great apes because this would have allowed this creature to accommodate a knuckle-walking, brachiating lifestyle. Now, uh, when you look at the history of anthropology, as uh, Colin Barras uh, points out in this article, there are instances where there were a very small minority of anthropologists that were willing to challenge this idea, arguing that maybe gorillas and chimps are actually evolutionarily more advanced, uh, more derived, evolutionarily speaking, than humans, which would have been much more primitive. Um, and that is that the last common ancestor would have looked much more like humans than it would have looked like, again, knuckle-walking, brachiating, ape-like creatures. But I think even Darwin refers to the last common ancestor in these terms, that it was an ape-like creature. Now, one of the things that the author of this piece does that I think is very interesting and very useful is that he talks about the role that molecular clock analysis has played in uh, the identity of the last common ancestor. And even though I've been studying anthropology for well over 20 years, probably closer to 25 years, I've never really fully appreciated the influence that molecular clock analysis has had on how anthropologists think about the last common ancestor of humans and chimps. Uh, it was, you know, one of those aha moments and then kind of a, a face palm when I realized, of course, this makes perfect sense. But this idea of molecular clock analysis basically says this, from looking at genetic data, either direct genetic data or inferred genetic data by comparing the structure or the sequences of proteins uh, and assuming a constant, evolu uh, constant mutation rate, you can actually estimate the time uh, that, uh, that two sister species in an evolutionary sense would have diverged from each other. Uh, uh, and the molecular clock analysis seems to indicate that humans and chimps would have diverged from each other about six to seven million years ago. And that that lineage that led to humans and chimps would have diverged from the lineage that produced gorillas roughly 11 million years ago. And that those uh, lineages, that, the, that lineage that produced gorillas, chimps, and humans would have diverged from that, that which produced orangutans about 14 million years ago. And so the idea is that since gorillas, chimps, and orangutans have so much in common, uh, anatomically speaking, in terms of their behavior, that this would have further reinforced the idea that the last common ancestor was an ape-like creature and that humans represent an evolutionary derived state. Now, uh, this thinking, however, in recent years, 
has undergone some significant revision and significant challenges. And the, the author of this piece identifies some of those key uh, insights. One of, one of them would have been, excuse me, uh, the, the, the characterization recently of the risk structure of gorillas and chimps, noting that there are subtle but yet significant differences in the risk structure, which suggests to some researchers that the gorilla wrist and the chimp wrist don't share a common evolutionary origin, but rather must have evolved independently two separate times. That this is an example of evolutionary convergence, meaning that the human, sorry, check that, that the gorilla and the chimp anatomy and behavior, knuckle walking behavior, may actually be an evolutionarily derived state, meaning that it, it's more reasonable to think that maybe the last common ancestor of human and chimps actually had a, 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 a anatomy, physiology, and behavior similar to that of modern humans. Now, in addition to that was the discovery of Artie, this uh, nearly complete uh, fossil specimen of Artipithecus ramidus that dates at about, about 4.4 million years in age. And a careful study of that skeletal, those skeletal remains indicates that this creature had the capacity to walk erect, that it was a bipedal creature. And because it is very close to where we think that last common ancestor would have lived, because we view this as being a rather primitive hominin, and the fact that it walked erect suggests that maybe again, humans actually represent the more primitive form and are closer to the last common ancestor than chimps and gorillas. And then in addition to that, there was a study published not so long ago when we wrote about this study, as well as Artipithecus ramidus in the updated and expanded edition of Who Was Adam, as well as articles on our website, that a evolutionary uh, comparison of the hand structure of humans the great apes and hominins uh, recovered from the fossil record seems to suggest that the human hand is actually primitive and that the, the hand structure of uh, chimpanzees is an evolutionarily derived state, meaning knuckle walking is an evolutionarily advanced uh, state, not a primitive state. And then there are some scientists who are claiming that molecular clock analysis may actually indicate that humans and chimps diverged about 12 million years ago, not 6 million years ago. And so when you put this all together, there's a growing um, sense among anthropologists that this idea that chimps are, again, a stand-in, evolutionarily speaking, for the last common ancestor may be an incorrect notion. In fact, the, the article concludes in this way, that it is true that today some researchers have a well thought through idea of what the last common ancestor looked like and how it behaved. The trouble is that other researchers have equally well, uh, well reasoned models that suggest a last common ancestor that looked and behaved in a completely different way. And this puts the research community in a bit of a quandary we will, will we be able to recognize a last common ancestor when we find it? So this is a, a remarkably candid article that basically concludes by saying anthropologists really do not know what the last common ancestors of humans and chimps look like. And that this traditional idea that has been entrenched in evolutionary anthropology for over 150 years is actually beginning to fall by the wayside but it's falling by the wayside in a manner that is not really all that convincing. There is a, a, a legitimate debate now as to what that last common ancestor looked like without any kind of evidence for clear resolution in sight. And one of the things that's interesting is that we actually discussed this issue in the expanded updated edition of Who is Adam in 2015. So it's somewhat gratifying to see a science journalist who is approaching uh, this this problem uh, from a, a standpoint in which this journalist is embracing an evolutionary framework to actually acknowledge that our criticism, uh, or at least implies that our criticism in Who Was Adam was actually a valid criticism of, again, the inability of evolutionary biologists to identify 
and characterize the nature of that last common ancestor that produced humans and chimps. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But in addition to that, there's some other issues that now create some ex, uh, and expand upon, uh, I, I think, the chaos surrounding the identity of the last common ancestor. We talked a little bit over a month ago about some recent work that suggests that maybe the last common ancestor of humans and chimps didn't live in Africa, which again has been the long-standing view among evolutionary biologists, but actually originated in Europe. Again, that creates uh, uh, some more chaos and confusion surrounding this question. And then also, uh, in recent years, we have now had available to us not only the human genome sequence, but also the, the sequence for the chimpanzee genome, the bonobo genome, and the gorilla genome. And interestingly enough, when whole genomes are compared, 25% of the human genome aligns more closely with the gorilla genome than with the chimpanzee genome, meaning that depending on what region of the human genome you use in comparisons, the data would actually say that our closest ancestor would be gorillas, not chimpanzees. So the bottom line is, again, I appreciate the candor in this, in this article, is that we really don't know the identity of the last common ancestor from an evolutionary perspective. Now, what, what, is, what difference does this make? Uh, is this really significant? I think the answer to th that question is, it is significant and it makes a big difference. You know, so often I meet people who are skeptics, who are seekers, who are uh, theistic evolutionist slash evolutionary creationist who are startled that I would reject the idea or at least be skeptical of the idea of human evolution given the fact that we have this uh, fossil record that is describing a, a large number of hominin species that existed between roughly uh, six to seven million years ago and uh, maybe even 30,000 uh, years ago uh, where some of these hominins would have coexisted with modern humans, that we have this very rich hominin fossil record. How on earth, in light of that, could you even be skeptical of human evolution? Because doesn't this hominin fossil record essentially uh, describe an evolutionary origin of humanity? Well, I appreciate um, that concern or that question very much, but the fact of the matter is, uh, as an old earth creationist, I don't deny the, the reality of the hominin fossil record. These are real creatures that existed, that, that disappeared, that went extinct in, in every instance. Uh, these are creatures that I believe are properly dated using scientific methodology. So the fossil record is giving us a sampling of a real natural history for these creatures on earth. Uh, I would argue that we know a fair amount about their biology and their behavior from the fossil record, from the accompanying archeological record associated with these hominins. That the geological setting for which these fossils are uncovered gives us a sense for their role in the ecology of the world at that time. But I'm skeptical that these hominin fossils actually represent evidence for human evolution. Now, the way I think of them as, older, as an older creationist is that these are creatures that God created that existed for a period of time that went extinct. They're intelligent creatures. They were creatures that had emotional capability like many animals do. Uh, I see them in the same vein that I would see uh, chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas. Remarkable, fascinating creatures. Uh, but I also would say that the shared features that we have with the hominins, as with the great apes, reflects an archetypical design that existed in the mind of a creator that was then functionally implemented in the created order. That is, the shared features reflect common design, not common descent, following in the footsteps of the late um, biologist Sir Richard Owen, who was a predecessor of Darwin, who advocated this idea of archetype biology. But then how do we, we make sense of, again, this hominid fossil record? Well, evolutionary biologists like to point to that fossil record and argue that these are transitional forms, that these are transitional intermediates. But it's interesting because when they use that term, they're using that term in an ambiguous way. Uh, when I use the term transitional intermediate, what I'm referring to is this idea that these uh, 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 that when I use the term, I'm sorry, transitional intermediate, I'm using the term to refer to creatures that would document a transformation 
from organism A to organism E, where the transitional intermediates would be B, C, and D, that are clearly documenting that pathway that are clearly part of that evolutionary lineage. That's how I think of the term transitional intermediate. That's how many people think of that term. Oftentimes, when that term is used by evolutionary biologists, they argue that these are simply creatures between two time points. In this case, six to seven million years ago, and roughly 150,000 years ago when modern humans appear on the scene. And they would argue that these intermediate forms are somehow related to each other in an evolutionary sense or somehow documenting and describing this evolutionary ascent of man. We just simply don't know the specifics. But because we have these hominid fossils in between these two time points, we can dub them transitional intermediates. Uh, though again, we don't know exactly which ones were absolutely uh, part of that transition from uh, an ape-like creature, or at least the last common ancestor more appropriately, in modern humans. So you can see that that term is being used in two very different ways. So when, I, as a creationist, I come along and say, I don't think there's compelling evidence for transitional forms documenting the evolutionary ascent of humanity. I'm using the first definition when evolutionary biologists come back and say, but look at all the fossils in the fossil record. These are transitional forms. You're wrong. We have a, an abundance of transitional forms. They're using the second definition. And that's where some of the, 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 cro some of the conversation is missing, where we're talking past each other because we're using very different terms. And in my view, as an old earth creationist, if you're going to say that those transitional forms between that two, those two time points actually are evidence for human evolution, then there's three things you need to establish. First is that you need to be able to show what the evolutionary relationship is among the hominins, that there needs to be consensus evolutionary trees. Secondly, you need to be able to document the pathway in which uh, humans ascend, uh, uh, emerge in an evolutionary sense. And then finally, you need to be able to identify last common ancestors for uh, key nodes in those evolutionary trees. And as this particular uh, article is pointing out, when it comes to a very critical node, the last common ancestor that humans and chimps would have shared, we simply don't even know what that creature would have looked like, let alone uh, failing to discover uh, an example of it in uh, the fossil record. Now, just because we don't have a, an example of this creature in the fossil record isn't, I think, devastating to human evolution, to be fair, because the fossil record and the fossil is incomplete. The fossilization process is riddled with vagaries, so it's possible that we would never ever discover that creature, but we should at least be able, from the evolutionary trees that we build, to be able to reach a consensus as to what this creature would have looked like, and I don't see that happening anytime soon. But this is not the only instance. For example, when it comes to another key transition, namely the origin of the Homo genus and Homo erectus, we don't know which of the hominins in the fossil record was critical in that transition. Was it Homo habilis or Australopithecus habilis, as some people would classify this organism? or this creature? Was it Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy? Was it Australopithecus africanus, or the Tong child? Was it Australopithecus gari? Was it Kenyanthropus, Kenyanthropus platyops? Was it Homo gontaniensis? Was it Australopithecus sediba? Was it Homo noleti? These are all creatures in the last several years that have been uh, positioned as being that transitional form, that last common ancestor that produced um, the, the Homo lineage, the Homo genus, and yet there's not consensus. None of these creatures withstands uh, scientific scrutiny. This is another place where we fail to identify the last common ancestor. And then also, recently there was a study done looking to identify the last common ancestors of humans and Neanderthals. From an evolutionary perspective, humans and Neanderthals represent separate evolutionary uh, branches. And people have long thought that Homo heidelbergensis was that creature that produced both of those lineages. A study was done recently where people looked at 1,200 teeth from humans and Neanderthals, and from that dental data reconstructed what the dental anatomy of the last common ancestor would have looked like. Heidelbergensis doesn't match it, neither does Homo anecessor, neither does Homo erectus. Again, we failed to identify a last common ancestor.
We also don't know the evolutionary relationships among the hominins. Uh, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but there's as many evolutionary trees as there are anthropologists. There's no consensus. And in fact, every time a new fossil is discovered, every time a new species is assigned to these fossils, everybody goes out and redraws their evolutionary trees and they still don't match. Uh, this is indicating a, a fundamental problem in my view because these new finds ought to bring clarity to what those evolutionary relationships are. They ought to crystallize ideas and, and make it clear certain evolutionary trees simply need to be eliminated from consideration, but that's not happening. Uh, and then finally, we don't know the pathway that produced modern humans. Every uh, hominin that has been considered traditionally to be part of that evolutionary ascent of man is rendered an evolutionary side branch or a dead end by anthropologists. And so when we put all these three things together, I think it's justifiable to be skeptical about the claim that evolution can account for the origin of humanity and that the hominid fossil record is somehow evidence for human evolution. It, it doesn't uniquely point to an evolutionary origin of humanity. We can understand the hominid fossil record from a creation model standpoint. Moreover, there are features in the hominid fossil record that are better accommodated when it comes to uh, a creation model. For example, bipedalism appears suddenly. There's no evolutionary uh, emergence of bipedalism. What we see is bipedalism showing up su uh, suddenly and is possessed by the very first hominins, say Helanthropus chadensis, Aurora tugenensis, for example, Artipithecus cadaba. All three had bipedal capabilities. Uh, also, when it comes to things like the sociocultural Big Bang and human uniqueness and human exceptionalism, that shows up explosively as well without any kind of evolutionary explanation. So the bottom line is this, that this article is a wonderful uh, and candid discussion of the failure of evolutionary biologists 150 plus years into the question of human evolution to d identify what that last common ancestors of humans and chimps would have looked like. That 150 years of research, that 150 years of insight has failed to yield an understanding of what that creature would have looked like. And this, again, uh, is emblematic of what I see in, in human evolution and among uh, evolutionary anthropologists, is ideas that are, are communicated to the lay public that are communicated in introductory biology classes, uh, even in introductory courses in human evolution, seem to be communicated as if they are well-established, robust ideas that are evidenced by the, the fossil record and genetic comparisons. But the fact of the matter is when you begin to dig into, the, into these questions and you peel uh, a few layers off the surface and get underneath the surface, what you see is ideas in human evolution are highly speculative, highly uncertain, that human evolution has more in common with literary criticism than science where ideas go in and out of favor or where ideas become vogue, but ideas really lack robust evidence ultimately. Uh, and uh, uh, just even the minimal amount of new data can throw the whole discipline into chaos. So at min at, I think at minimum, as an old earth creationist, my skepticism of the evolutionary claims are justified, at least when it comes to human origins. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and, and bring things to a close there. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, thank everybody for watching this broadcast. Thank you for your interest in uh, the work that we do at Reasons to Believe. Uh, I would again ask everybody who's watching, please check in, let us know where you're watching from, react using the like button, that's much appreciated, and then offer your comments on this topic of uh, the last common ancestor of humans and uh, chimps. Even if you disagree, I want to hear your perspective. And if you have questions that you would like for me to consider for future broadcasts, go ahead and post them in the comment section. You can private message me or post them on my Facebook page. I read and consider every question and every comment that comes to me via Facebook, via Twitter, uh, but I just don't have time to respond to everything, even though these questions are very good, but I do take to heart what you ask and I do take to heart your, the comments that you make, the criticisms that you level against my views.
I take them into consideration and, and c carefully contemplate them. I just want to know that you guys are heard, and I very much appreciate all of you. So until next time, hopefully next week, I just want to say God bless each and every one of you. And I want to remind you that the more that we know about science, the more that we have reasons to believe. And this is truly the case when it comes to anthropology.